And now, prepare for a fascinating presentation on the topic of Egyptian mysticism and cosmology, and the alchemical Egyptian Book of the Dead. Please, a big earth keeper, standing round of applause, for our next featured speaker, my dear friend and mentor, the amazing and brilliant, John Van Auken. I'm going to uh, take you on a journey through uh, Edgar Cayce's insight into the uh, near future of our lives. From his perspective, most of you know, there really was, it's so hard for our three-dimensional minds to grasp this, but there, there never was a real beginning, and there never is a real end. Within a infinite womb of consciousness we were conceived and we have been uh, percolating on self-discovery and understanding of the collective and then knowing yourself to be yourself and yet one with the whole and the journey uh, was so um, much a celestial beings journey even though we think of it as a terrestrial beings journey that when we first descended, Edgar Cayce said there was an involution prior to the evolution. We were very wise. That's why when our archaeologists find megalithic structures of ancient periods of time carved so perfectly and aligned so perfectly to the cosmos and the events of the planet's movements, it doesn't fit with the idea of evolution we're supposed to be the know-it-all. And every time we've tried to replicate the Great Pyramid, we have failed at it. It is, is, it is amazing structure. When we were descending with our wisdom and with our celestial nature, we were able to carve the Great Pyramid 
and build it in a manner that contained a chronogram of time. And it correlated to the ancient Egyptian book of the dead. And this prophecy I'm going to share with you, I'm going to take you through this journey and show you the correlate between these two magnificent structures. The first thing you need to understand is that the Egyptian book of the dead existed long before Pharaoh's and the Egypt you and I know. Long before. And... Um, Many of the early scribes who actually carved this on temple walls recorded the fact that they got it from a previous people. Now, Edgar Casey, as you know, said this previous group uh, was in existence 11,000 to 10,000 BC, which doesn't fit with archaeological evidence of current Egyptian, ancient Egyptian wisdom. However, there have been some recent discoveries. Here's the Stonehenge in southern Egypt, uh, roughly 6,500 years ago, which puts it about 1,000 years before Stonehenge in uh, England. And uh, these people in Nocta, uh, southern Egypt area, uh, were uh, celestially aware and recorded much, but they did it orally. And it is very possible they didn't have bodies like you and I. Edgar said we, we were not as dense as we are today. Therefore, digging for bones to find us is not going to work out too well. <laughs> um, but eventually, we gradually came into matter deeper and deeper into matter. Um, now, uh, we know that this pre-dynastic Stonehenge complex stood on the shoreline of an ancient lake. At around 9,000 BC. Now where that gets excited is when you find out that uh, the Sphinx was now reanalyzed and it was determined that the, uh, the weathering on the Sphinx was due to tropical rain runoff, not so much wind erosion. Well, when that discovery occurred, it, it, it threw it back to around 9,000 to 11,000 BC, right when Casey said, this existence was going on and this was carved. So that is interesting. Of course, the African monsoon did shift. And by 2800 BC, the period that fits more with the archeology span we have, desert uh, was beginning to grow there because the monsoon had gone further south. So you did not have the lush plain that you had um, during the period of the Nabta beings or people. Yet the Egyptian Book of the Dead was conceived by them and held by them orally. Um, the pyramid text was first discovered by Sir Gaston Maspero in 1881. Um, the text was found on the Pyramid of Unus and uh, Unus ruled roughly around the periods of 27, uh, 2,375 BC to 3, 2,345. Um, but it was also in Teddy's uh, pyramid and in Pepe I and Pepe II. These are all pyramids in Saqqara near the Steppe Pyramid of Zoser that most of you are familiar with. These are small pyramids. I've been there. I've been inside them. And um, the... Uh, utterances, every one of the ancient texts of the Egyptian Book of the Dead begins with words that say, to be spoken. And so they were like uh, spells or mantras or incantations. And they were called utterances. And they carved them on the walls for the first time, the, what we would call the ancient Egyptians carved them but they belong to a people far be, uh, uh, older than those people. Uh, Gaston Maspero uh, identified that many of the texts he found, the actual scribes themselves confessed that they really didn't know how old they were and really didn't know much about the original people from which they came, uh, but they knew they were sacred. And the priests overseeing these scribes took them with great reverence. So there was an importance to them. Here is a Smithsonian Institute photograph of Unis' pyramid and the pyramid text carved on the wall in uh, these hieroglyphs. 
Here's another shot. Of course, later, yes, they were carved on papyruses. Here are several of those. These, these are the papyruses of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Wallace Budge published them in his um, 1899 publication, The Book of the Dead. Even names and, and data specific were, were in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. You'll see Casey comment on this in a minute. Now, let me see if I have the laser pointer. I want to sort of show you a metaphysical interpretation of this papyrus. This is the horizon of heaven. And beneath heaven, that glyph means beneath heaven, there's the horizon of heaven, are the lion of yesterday and the lion of tomorrow. Yesterday, you and I were yin and yang in one. Feminine and masculine were united in our spiritual nature. Feminine is yin in the sense of the inner self. And remember in Genesis, when God cast a deep sleep over the Adamic androgynous body, he reached in and pulled out the yin. Kava was the first Hebrew word used, life giver. It's that part of you and me that conceives, pulls out the yin and creates separate bodies for us. But originally prior to this, this occurs in about chapter two, verse 22 of Genesis. So we've already been conceived in chapter one, but our genders were united in oneness. And here you see that in this little temple drawing here, they come out, you become individual souls projecting yin or yang, uh, your masculine and uh, your feminine uh, characteristics of your whole soul. Uh, the scent of the lotus blossom is the scent of heaven and the lion of yesterday knows that scent well and see your feminine has it right on her third eye. Your inner intuitive self knows that scent of heaven. The lion of tomorrow is looking to the phoenix bird because death occurs. This is a mastaba, a place of burying the dead. For the first time immortal that we were, uh, the Maya say the lords of the underworld tricked us into playing a game in which the penalty for losing was death. And the immortal children of God were fooled completely and died mentally, consciously, and went into the cycles of life and death. The phoenix bird, this is the phoenix bird of ancient Egypt, senses the scent of the lotus blossom of the truth of the higher chakras open and overcomes death. There's a, the whole book is about an initiate or a dead uh, soul regaining consciousness of the truth of life beyond death. Here you even see an Egyptian honoring two cobras on top of lotus and papyrus. Now, uh, neither of those plants will support a cobra. So an initiate looking at this would have known, hey, this must be symbolic. If I raise the kundalini life force of my body, the lotus blossoms and the papyrus opens. And those are symbols of your lower self who studies and reads the papyruses, nourishes your mind with higher thought. And the lotus is your higher self who has spontaneous enlightenment of the truth. So throughout this book, these guidances occur. The book then became carved on a lot of temples. So here it is on a beautiful temple, the whole Egyptian book of the dead. You can see every bit of it. Some parts are accentuated. Here we are. These are the godlings of the heavens, you and me. There's an aspect of you up in the heavens. And we traveled together as soul groups for a very long time. Here you see on another wall, out of the womb of the celestial mother, the consciousness of the creator, we were conceived as little children, sucking our thumb. And we entered the dung world. See the dung beetle body with the ram's head? At the time of Aries, in the beginning, you entered the dung world. And dung was going to happen. <laughs> but like the dung beetle, who rolls his dung, towards the rising sun every morning and plants the seed of life in it, by high noon, you will burst forth with new life and rise out of the dung of your life. 
And if you talk to any depth psychologist, they will tell you in the dung of your life is your resurrection, is your illumination. If you face that, you will come forth a new and brighter. Here you see again um, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, but now you see the depiction of the mind of God and the spirit of God. When the ancient Egyptians looked around for uh, earthly symbols of spiritual forces, they said, put their hands in the position of adoration and remove their heads, and that'll symbolize spirit. So this is called ka. You're in the essence of the elevated consciousness, but you're not thinking, so they remove the head. But when they draw big arms in that position, that's the great ka, the great spirit. God, and those of you over here, God, the great spirit, and the great spirit's mind or consciousness conceived you as an individual to take the creation from the infinite into the finite, come to know yourself, to be yourself, and return into oneness with the whole. That was the marvelous journey. The Kundalini life force, see the double cobras, Ida and Pingala of Hinduism, will be with you all the way. You will have the life force. You will go through cycles. See the cycles of the golden stars and the little circled consciousness? You will enter into the stars for a sojourn. You will return into individual consciousness to discover yourself. Edgar Cayce talks about that all the time. Past life incarnations of soul growth with one another with planetary sojourns in between incarnations. When you die here physically, you leave your body behind, your mind and soul journeys into other dimensions, and you are very active there. There's lots of activity. It's not rest in peace until the next shot at the earth. Not at all. There's much to do. And Edgar Cayce sometimes when he was giving a reading would pass by realms in which souls were very busy and he would share that insight with us. Um, most of the text in the Egyptian Book of the Dead begin with the word ro and may be translated as mouth, speech, utterance, spell, enchantment, or incantation. We believe, you know, the nuance of the word is to be spoken, to be sounded, and it is like a spell, like an incantation. They are spells cast and information to guide and protect the soul on his or her journey through the underworld. Now, you and I have come to a new level of awareness. The underworld, now we understand, is the unconscious realm, the subconscious deep within us, not necessarily a physical place under the ground anymore. We're more fourth dimensional in our awareness than we used to be, not so three dimensional. And to the heavens, the heavens, higher states of consciousness, higher consciousness. We understand that. We have flown our rockets up there, and you don't go through suddenly a door that hits heaven. We know that. But we've come to understand consciousness so much better. In the first chapters, the deceased, and you've got to understand, the Egyptians call it, oh, actually the Egyptians did not call it the Book of the Dead. Later archaeologists called it that. They called it the book of the master of the hidden places. Hint, hint. <laughs> Your body's dead, but you're alive, and we're going to tell you what to do in this crazy place you find yourself. Edgar said in the first 10 minutes after death, the soul self is stunned for a moment. Oh, my gosh, I can't vibrate the vocal cords. Nobody's eardrums are moving when I try to speak to them. They don't hear me. I can't reflect light off the surface of my body. It's lying over there. They don't see me in the room. But you're there. And suddenly, there's a certain uh, alarm that goes off in yourself. And you start to seek within yourself, what just happened? <laughs> and you move into your deeper self. And there you find the one who is comfortable with this. It's the one that you know so well. And I'll prove it to you. You are so familiar with this deeper part of yourself. Remember when we're waking in the morning and we have a profound dream or vision or image or nightmare and we're going, oh my gosh, I have got to explore this. this is... But as you get closer to the surface, you notice your bladder's full. <laughs> so 
naturally you say, well, I'll just go to the bathroom, empty the bladder, come back and process this magnificent dream. You go to the bladder, I mean the bathroom, empty the bladder, come back to the side of the bed and what? It, how can that be? That's impossible. I had this. It was profound. No, no. You had the bladder. The other part of you had the dream. You just walked through the veil between these two parts. <laughs> A veil so subtle, you didn't notice you moved through it, but so opaque, you can't see back through it when you're out here. Now, if you start to really perceive that truth, that the outer me really is a limited perspective and there is an opaque veil I don't see through and you start to work hard at sensing the subtle difference between your inner self and your outer self and when the shift is being made you grow tremendously in your consciousness and you start to become an incarnate soul not a personality not just the outer self socialized by your upbringing and your education, you tap into the eternal part of yourself. And sometimes when you're talking with others, you'll learn to actually see the soul speaking to you as well as the personality that's trying to really impress you. And if, if you've ever dated and then got married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is an important part of enlightenment and the path of enlightenment. And here it is perfectly put together. Um, the deceased or the initiate. Now, Edgar said the Book of the Dead was used also for initiates, not just the dead. It was used for the dead to help a, a soul that had now uh, left its body, but also initiates went, and many of you in here went through this, I am certain of that. Enters the tomb, you descend into the underworld, and goes through a series of incantations to awaken its ability to speak, hear, and move, without the uh, vocal cords of the physical body or the surface light or the muscle body structure of the physical body, but the spirit body. And through various passages required for his or her successful transition through the realms of the dead. Of course, we are speaking of the living dead. The next chapters educate the initiate on the origin of the gods. And we now know uh, with our advanced awareness growing all the time that gods of mythology are actually creative forces. And we termed them and named them because we were so three dimensional. But now that we're fourth dimensional, we understand the dynamics of, of uh, creative influences that can be personified, but actually are cosmic and affect all of us and about key places but places now we understand to be states of consciousness then come chapters guiding the dead or the initiate through the sky into the sunlight and into the sun boat of course we're in the realm of the dead so the sunlight in the sun boat is the light of consciousness and uh, then uh, by night descending again into the underworld to meet Osiris the judge of the soul what is the judge of the soul our conscience Every one of the near-death experienced people shares with us that at one moment, depending on their personal upbringing and perspective, they either saw a light being or an angel or Jesus or some essence of higher personification of beingness and their whole life in panorama before them and no judgment, just looking at it your consciousness evaluating how it went this life. Edgar Cayce says, it's like a picnic basket that you prepared for your soul. And when you pass on, your soul opens the basket and sometimes goes, uh-oh, <laughs> gonna be a rough sojourn <laughs> between, or sometimes it opens the basket and goes, whoa, lots of nourishment this time. I was one of those who once upon a time did open that empty basket. And let me tell you this life, I was determined to never let that basket be that empty again. <laughs> so I came in with a drive. Oops. Um, the passage of an entity from this world to the next is from its human incarnation through the transition of physical death. And there is a transition 
the uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead and the Egyptian both show uh, the series of transitions on through many transcending experiences and tests even. Now remember, initiate can be going through this also. Until it reaches its ultimate potential, a fully conscious, eternal star godling, Aku we are called. Ultimately, you're an Ak or Aku. And when you translate that, that means a star being. Now, legend from Maya and Egyptian have this in the story of who we are. In um, Mayan, Toltec, Aztec, it's told this way. The great winged serpent god, depending what language you're speaking, um, called Quetzalcoatl, Kuku Khan, or Guku Maas, they're all various language, all words mean winged serpent being, okay? The great god of that energy brings the children of God together and says, now some darkness has fallen upon the earth and we need to bring new light to the earth so we can resolve all this. And the story goes that the most beautiful among the souls comes forward and says, well, it has to be me. <laughs> and of course, Quetzalcoatl, the winged serpent god, says, yes, of course. Creates a sacred fire and says, leap into the fire. But as the beautiful one approaches, the fire is so hot he backs away. Then the ugliest among the children of God comes forward and says, I'll do it for the sake of everyone. And he leaps into the fire. All the children of God run to the edge of heaven and look down at the earth, and the sun comes up. Ooh, they say, that's a good light for the earth to be guided by. And then the beautiful one immediately runs over and jumps into the fire. So all the children go back to the corner and look, and the moon comes up, and they all giggle. <laughs> Not as bright as the sun. Of course, the moral there being... Ego accentuation is not going to bring you the greater light. <laughs> and in astrological interpretations, we often see the moon as the personality and the sun as the greater consciousness. Then the great winged serpent God turns to all the other children of God and says, now each of you must put your hearts into this mission to bring light to the earth. And they all put their hearts into the sacred fire run to the edge of heaven, and all the stars come up. And every heart of every soul in this room has a significant, specific star in the heavens above. And every scientist tells us that there are more stars in the visible universe, just with your eyes, than there are grains of sand on all the beaches and deserts of this planet. You go over to Egypt, you have the same story. In fact, the ceilings of Egyptian tombs and temples all have stars carved on them because all the souls are seen as unique stars, unique points of light, star beings temporarily incarnate into dung beetle bodies <laughs> for a sojourn. In the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the deceased or initiate asserts that she or he was originally conceived in the primordial sea of infinity. The ancient Egyptians considered it important to know the book of the dead while you were alive incarnate. And it was seen in this passage, quote, this is from the book of the Avani. If this text be known upon earth, then will he or she be able to come forth on any day he or she pleases and to enter into his heavenly habitation unobstructed. Knowing these truths while you're incarnate, you don't have to worry, wait till you die or, or anything like that. Edgar said sleep every night was a shadow of death and that in sleep your soul was free to go through the cosmos. Sometimes he would give a reading for a person and he, you know how he went into trance. I don't know if you all know, he'd put his hand over his forehead like this. When he saw a point of white light, he would move his hand over his solar plexus and he would go into deep breathing and rim, rapid eye movement. And if you didn't give him the suggestion, he'd fall asleep on you and have a dream, wake up 20 minutes later, no reading. So you had to catch him when his eyes went into rim and his wife or his son would catch him and say, you will have before you the inquiring mind of Mary Smith. And he said that point of light would move and he would move with it. 
And it would go through dimensions and eventually it came to what he saw three dimensionally as this great hall of records in which the book of life of every soul was being held. And out would come the keeper of the books and show him what he could and could not read to Mary. But as she got more readings over the years, he read more of the book. But at first he just picked out, he was guided to just show four or six little uh, things affecting her presently. As he looked through the book this way, he was looking into her future and he would say things like, uh, don't marry him, he's a father figure. Next year comes the man of your dreams. And she'd go, yeah, but you know, this is what I have now. He said, trust me, <laughs> you, will, you will recycle through this in three and a half years when the two of you divorce if you don't wait <laughs> for the right one. So he was looking into the future or he'd say something like, be very careful in the next season. There's a danger of a serious accident. It does, it's your karma, but it doesn't have to become physical. If you process it in your heart and mind with the collective consciousness of the creator, you can resolve this without it having to be physical, but you must be careful. Stuff like that. If he flipped the book this way, he was looking into their past and, of course, would say things that would just blow their minds. Ah, here's the fire altar princess of Atlantis, a wondrous leader of the group and all. And she'd say, listen, I'm ironing shirts in Oklahoma right now as a housewife of three kids. I have really fallen. Uh, Edgar Cayce wrote that woman and said, oh, heck, I, I was the high priest of ancient Egypt and here today I'm over here for 30 bucks trying to give a reading. <laughs> Can barely feed my family. <laughs> uh, Gaston Maspero also noted that the Great Pyramid and the Egyptian Book of the Dead reproduce the same original. The one is in words in the Book of the Dead, and the other is in stone. So now we're going to start to see that the book, the coming forth, uh, the book of coming forth into the light or coming forth by day, with also this section of the master of the hidden places, mentions a thing called the light in several chapters, especially in chapter 15. Well, the Great Pyramid was actually called Takut, which means the light. And when Marsham Adams in 1890 saw this, he said, wait a minute, could chapters in the book be relating to passageways in the pyramid? And he started the idea, and then a lot of archaeologists jumped on it and started researching the Book of the Dead, which describes passageways, halls, chambers, transitions, tests, dangers, and wrong turns, and various uh, gates that you had to go through. So then they started to correlate this. In 1910, David Davidson and H. Aldersmith actually published the correlate so that the Great Pyramid called the light, then the descending passageway was the descent in the book. The ascending passage and the grand gallery were called the double hall of truth. So he started to see the correlation. The door of the descent, the hall of truth in darkness, the queen's chamber was actually called the chamber of regeneration, the chamber of rebirth, and the chamber of the moon. The king's chamber was called the chamber of resurrection, the chamber of the grand orient, the chamber of the open tomb. Remember, there was never a lid on that sarcophagus, and the sarcophagus is larger than the door entrance to the king's chamber, which means the Egyptians built the whole chamber around the sarcophagus. It's rose um, granite, and it, if you hit it with the fat of your hand, it will ring. It is a magical thing to lie in and meditate, and if you orient yourself in two directions, and Edgar talked about those, you will have a different experience. Uh, so anyway, once this correlation started, people started really going. Here's the original entrance. We don't go in by this entrance, you guys. Uh, but this is the original entrance, and right there in the middle, that right there is the glyph for the horizon of heaven. See that right there? The horizon of heaven, or the light that comes over the horizon. And a measuring mark was discovered uh, on the boss mark, and there was a lot of debate in the 1800s about this. 
Uh, Flanders Petrie, he kind of rejected it, uh, but many others uh, thought it was a fascinating little device. It's, it's in the chamber of the Triple Veil. It's in the only granite stone there, and it sits right there. And it is not a lifting thing, because there would need to be one on the other side, and there is none. So it's, it was perceived to be some measuring device. And sure enough, the flat space underneath the half-rising sun uh, was considered to be the, quote, pyramid inch. And sure enough, when they started measuring the outside of the pyramid and various factors in the pyramid, it appeared to be correct. And that's how they got the chronogram. This is David Davidson's published um, layout of the Great Pyramid in his book. It's also in my latest book, 2013. And as you can see, he has the names of the chambers, the chamber of the open tomb, the chamber of the second birth. Uh, the, hall, the grand gallery is called the Hall of uh, Truth while in the light and the low passageway. I'll show you this in a minute. Uh, where you can only duck walk your way up through there is called the Hall of Truth in Darkness. Edgar was asked about this and he said, any time you had the initiate had to go through a low, difficult thing, it was to develop humility and meekness in the initiate. You had to subdue self-exaltation. You had to humble the ego in order to awaken the collective self that knows it's one with all of life. So when you had to bend over and go through this with such stress, it humbled you a great deal. And there are several places, some of which are profoundly difficult to get through. One interesting thing I want to show you, and I'll show you another picture. Look at the passageway towards the chamber of the second birth. Do you see it dilate right there? Yes, I'm going down that passageway. I'm sweating. My thighs are screaming, what are you doing? And I'm going through, the, and suddenly it opens up. I'm not in the birthing chamber yet, but I'm about to be born again. And I stand up, and I go, oh, take some of the pressure off and everything. But by then, I'm humbled. I'm, I'm not showing off or anything. Sweat's running. <laughs> So I go into the sacred little birthing chamber and it is so magnificent. The vibrations are awesome. So much of this, here's another low one up here. There's two right there. Before you can go into the triple veil, the veil of, between the conscious mind and the sub, between the sub and the super, and between your super conscious and the universal consciousness. Those are the veils. You have to bend down low and go through and that's to subdue your sense of egocentric self now we're up in the uh, there's the chamber of the triple there here's the king's chamber here's the grand gallery all the way through the egyptian book of the dead one inch pyramid inch equals one year of time and david davidson did this perfectly he was an outstanding uh, mathematician scientist but he noticed that the chapters change. When you hit the great step, one inch is now one month. Things happen in one twelfth of the time. Time is sped up. You're moving fast. And as he measured it, he came up with dates for World War I. Uh, the war to end all wars was the first low passageway. And then he comes to the final tribulation, another low one here. And it begins with the Great Depression and runs through to the far wall. Now Davidson and Aldersmith hit the far wall around 1956 in their measurement, and they thought that was the end. They thought it was all over. In 1930, now they did their work in 1910 to 1924. In 1930, Edgar Cayce in trance was asked about this, and he said, no, they were supposed to go up the wall. <laughs> so here it is, up the wall. So you hit the wall, and you start going up the wall. And Edgar said there's seven stages of human descent into matter, spirit descent into matter, and leaving this whole system. There are seven ages, seven stages. The five of them are represented by granite stone and the two top ones by limestone. And when you hit the apex, the prophecy of the Great Pyramid is over, he said. 
Casey said, it's, it's done, the fifth root race begins. A new body, a more luminescent body, one with 12 chakras. And some guy asked him, well, could you tell me the other chakras? And Edgar from Trance, he was always a little bit of a smart aleck. Edgar from Trance said, wow, you're not using the seven. <laughs> so be careful what you ask for. At least be worthy of the answer. <laughs> Okay, so you have five granite stones, two limestones, the seven. Every time you're in stone, Edgar says it's a, it's a hard developing working period for humanity and the souls of the earth. Every time you hit an air pocket, it is a buoyant, expansive period. And guess what? There's 2012 right there. Now, notice the stone is not even. So some come out early and some come out late. We're right here, you guys. 2012 right there. And some come out early and some come out a little later. And there's an expansive period of consciousness. Then there's another challenge, a few more. And then by 2038, we hit that apex and the prophecy. When I first saw this, I was 20 some years old working at ARE as a printer. And I was a wreck for weeks when I realized that this whole darn journey was known to us so much that we could carve it in stone and then we had to walk it and live it. I, I was stunned. It haunted me for a long time. Okay, here's Casey. We're going to go through some of his readings. There are periods when even the hour, day, year, place, country, nation, town, and this is the spooky part, and individuals are pointed out in the pyramid chronogram. That's how correct are many of these prophecies. How could we have known that? As celestial beings, did we know what it would be like to go into ultimate individuation, totally isolated in one body by ourselves, to leave our soul group of oneness? Remember, in the ancient times, the daughters of Isis flew together. The sons of Ra flew together. They were one, one flock of birds, of souls. Edgar Cayce says, look at the book of Job. When it says, the morning stars sang together at the coming of man, the morning stars were us. We were homogenous. We were harmonious. We loved each other. We were one with each other. You couldn't individuate us. Now, as we started to individualize, like the daughters of Isis, you would start to take on a more individual name. Isis Reva, Isis Nueva, and you're starting to individuate. You're still of the collective. Do you see what I mean? We were coming out of that oneness, that harmonious, and it was going to be very difficult to be all alone in a separate body all by yourself. So much so that the Egyptians, when they looked around for a symbol, picked the dung beetle. <laughs> This carcass is as ugly to the soul and hard to deal with as a dung beetle's body to us with our nice soft flesh bodies. We think, ugh, what a creature. Well, don't talk to your deeper self too quickly because he's going to go, ick, you don't know how long I've endured this ugliness. <laughs> Okay, here's Edgar again. Uh, all changes that came in the religious thought in the world are shown there in the pyramid chronograph. In the variations in which the passage through same is reached. So the passages do change. The color of the stone changes. And you go from standing up in a glorious gallery to bending real low or even crawling it sometimes. Or to the open tomb. And so you see I drew over here the open tomb to the apex. See the red line from the open tomb to the apex. And that brings us to the end of it. Uh, when asked about Davidson and Alder Smith's work, he said many of these deductions are correct. The ancient Egyptians did do this and they correlated it with the Book of the Dead that came from the Napta people long before the Pharaonic period. But some of Davidson's stuff is overdrawn. You'll actually see Davidson drawing dotted lines and trying to make the Bible story fit. And in some cases, you can see where it's overdrawn by him. But then Casey says the magic word for you and me. 
only an initiate may understand. And an initiate is not necessarily someone special. It's someone who is tapped through the veil. Someone who has touched their inner self. Someone who has a sense of the greater truth and the greater destiny and who we really are. And all of us in this room are among those. Okay, here's a big reading for his. And 378 is uh, a, a major series for him. Giza is the place of the initiates, and they're gaining by personal application. If there's one great teaching in the Casey material is you have to apply it. People would come to him with stuff, and he said, yeah, but if you don't live it, it is nothing but knowledge, period. You are not that. You just know about that. If you apply it, you are that. Uh, and by the journeys through various activities, the various activities we experience enrich our souls. We learn more about our creative uh, um, source and the creator by living various activities that are manifestations or expressions of him. Later, I'll show you some Kabbalistic stuff that will relate to this. A soul becomes conscious, aware, and its contact with the universe. Now, this is Edgar's attempt to try to describe this. So he says all these words hyphenated. The universal, cosmic, God, creative forces, that essence of, out of which we all came, in its experience by feeding upon the food, the fruits, the results of the spirit, of God, of life, of reality. Then he lists them. Love, just like James said earlier that Metatron guided him. Love, hope, kindness, gentleness, brotherly love, patience. Then uh, uh, Gladys told me that whenever Edgar yelled or got loud, she would all cap the words in her shorthand. And so then he said, these make for the awareness in the soul of its relationship to the creative force that is manifest in self, in the ego, in the I am of each soul, and of the great I am that I am. That little I am that we are was given to us from the great I am. That spark is the creator within us, to know yourself, to be yourself. The ego is not a problem when it is the higher ego. Come to know yourself. You really need to pursue self-awareness. I'll show some of this in some readings later. But this, it's the lower ego. Remember how Carl Jung, uh, the great deaf psychologist, would write self with a lower S and then sometimes with a capital S to show you the difference? And of course, you've all met or given birth to or married a lower S. That became a, you helped make a better capital S, my wife would assure you that occurred with me. <laughs> or you implored, employed a lower S or were employed by a lower S, and eventually the two of you reached the higher S, hopefully. The old record in Giza is from the journey to the Pyrenees. The journey to the Pyrenees was the end of the ancient era of Atlantis and Lemuria. It is Edgar's way of saying, migrating to a new reality, and the old way is gone. The powers and cosmic forces that we had in Atlantis and Lemuria had now to be lost so that we would work intently on the dark side of ourself and the immature psyche. Most of it's the immature psyche. You, we all think too much of evil and negative stuff. We all think too much of karma. Really, the Archangel Michael states it straight out. You will be tested as by fire. Most of what we're dealing with is the test, not the karma. You're already on the path. Much of your seeking is, is brought you grace from karma. But what you're hitting is the test. And like Edgar said, thoughts are things and they're as real as a stick in the eye. Thoughts. I was a mess for two years after hearing that. I just kept thinking, oh, God. And he said, every thought was recorded on the collective mind. I went, oh, my God. I, and Edgar could read that. Oh. oh, I was screwed up all through that period. 
I just went around. I've already messed it up. But then I came across a reading that said, new thoughts override old thoughts. And that's it. (laughs) So one time my wife and I said, uh, okay, this is true and we believe it, right? Right. And we're supposed to live it. Right, right. Okay. So I'm not going to think badly of you and you're not going to think badly of me. Right? No matter what happens in the marriage. (laughs) Such good intentions. About a week later, we're going, you're thinking bad of me. (laughs) I'm I'm trying not to. (laughs) The test. (laughs) The Egyptian prophecy began with an involution of spirit uh, into matter, of spirit and mind into matter. And Edgar says the mind divided. The superconscious expressed the soul mind called what we call the subconscious. Edgar said, that's the soul mind. That's the dreaming mind that when you're in it, you think it's you. It is you. But if you step through the veil, you come into the conscious mind, which is the expressed temporary mind of physical incarnation in a three-dimensional realm. And it's important to develop that. But Edgar encouraged us with our children not to break down their fourth dimensional imaginative mind too quickly. You do have to teach them you can't walk into this without bouncing off of it. That's a three dimensional lesson. But rather than squash their theories about something in the closet or something underneath the bed, or one of the ants has a strange look about her, that's the child's fourth dimensional mind still fresh from coming in, you know, he would encourage us. And and of course, as you reawaken, and many of us have, that mind is there and the veil is very transparent for us. Um, Then an evolution up through matter until souls regain the spirit consciousness they once possessed, but at a much more mature level. And I put a lot of this uh, prophetic stuff in the new book that just just came out. So... uh, Let me shift to the next PowerPoint and we'll begin the next stage, which is dealing with Egyptian mysticism. Uh, So we're going to move a little bit from prophecy to metaphysics here. Ancient Egyptian mysticism. And this will go over into this afternoon, so we'll stop at noon and I'll take it over to the afternoon. Of course, Egypt is in many ways, a marvelous place. These are the Felucas of the Nubians. Now mostly uh, Arab Egyptians run them, but used to be Nubians. I've been to Egypt 35 times, and uh, when I first used to go, I was always with the Nubians, uh, and it was marvelous. They are one of the few remaining true ancient Egyptians. You understand the Nubians were there way, way back. They were relating with Rata and the other Ararat tribe, if you know the story, it's in my book on the Casey's Tales of Egypt. But, um, and then, of course, the beautiful monuments and all that many of you saw in February with James, right? Yep, I, I was there in April with our ARE group. And, of course, the pyramids in the desert. And there's the Valley of the Kings across the Nile from Luxor. The land of the dead, put quotes around dead because these guys are walking around, the land of the living dead. And there's the great Pharaoh, Hatshepsut, or as my English friends taught me, hot chicken soup. (laughs) Hatshepsut is mentioned in the Edgar Cayce readings as one of the greatest enlightened teachers of ancient Egypt, a female Pharaoh, and there were several. We have three others in recorded history of major female pharaohs. And you also should know that in the great uh, Hebrew faith originally, there were female high priestesses. If you read the New Testament carefully, you'll notice the baby Jesus is being shown to a woman at the temple. There was only one temple that could happen at, Mount Carmel. The Essenes considered women to be equal to men, and therefore they could go into the Holy of Holies, touch the ark, and have direct contact with the Creator. So there was, 
even though you read history about male dominance, there was always a faction who knew the truth and maintained it all the way through. Hatshepsut's an example of a divine, powerful female pharaoh. You'll notice the tourist guides uh, like to call her a queen. That's kind of lowering her from the title of pharaoh. And they like to spin stories about her being an adulteress. That's just a favorite male thing to do. It's not true. Edgar said it's not true. Do you know that in, not in, uh, not in uh, tourist Egyptian stories, but in true Egyptian legends, she disappeared. It's recorded in Egyptian history, she vanished. Well, Edgar was asked about that from trance. And he said, she left with Moses into the desert to find God. She and her eldest daughter. I thought, well, that is so cool. <laughs> her name means foremost of the noble ladies. Truth is the spirit of Ra. And they're just, we, we were very human beings. This is us. These are pictures of us here. See all the girls ready for the ceremony? So beautifully dressed and all. And it was said that the Egyptians could actually put the spirit of a person in any art or statue. Look at that statue of Tut. The artist is so in tune with the creative forces, it can actually put the spirit of Tut in the statue. Look at these two, even the expressions on their face. You can tell she has the greater sense of humor. <laughs> Can't you? Yeah. Look, he's so stern and serious and he's got his job, but she's going to make him a better man. <laughs> and she takes it lightly. She knows this is eternal, Bob. I know you think this is the only thing. <laughs> anyway, here we go. Now we're in the uh, tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Uh, queens and artisans, and we're down here where they really hid the tomb. So when they try to tell you that the pharaohs were buried in pyramids, I want you to know not one mummy was ever found by any scientific archaeologist in any pyramid of over 100 of them. They were all found in the Valley of the Kings. So this theory is about a metaphysical death, an initiation a process of teaching you how to go through death consciously and then how to gain your power to speak without vocal cords. <clears throat> this is one of the artisans. His name is Senedjim, and we'll stop with him this, uh, this morning. Senedjim would work all day on Pharaoh's tomb, come home, get a little food, and go into his garage and make his own little tomb. But what Senedjim did was profound it was amazing. In the far corner, he carves this image. And in this image are some of the greatest symbols of mystical truth. Between your two eyes is a white spot of light, the pure original light. Around it is the shin. The shin is a blue circle bound to a blue shaft. Blue always symbolized spirit, green, ghostly, discarnate energy and red as the flesh blood body. And here's the blue spirit. And those two, the shaft and the circle are tied by a uh, rope to one another bound. The circle symbolizes infinity and femininity, the feminine spirit or Kava in Hebrew life giver. It's a part of all of us, no matter what gender you are. The shaft is temporality or the male, the masculinity, the energy of the erection of the power to carry the sword or till the soil, the plow, the doer, the strong one with the muscles, the feminine, the intuitive, the inner, the one who creates life with inside, gestates it. And even when it's manifest out here, can bring nourishment from within herself to nourish it from within herself. She can bring the food, the manna from within her. This is our feminine and masculine united. When you retouch those, those, we are separated. You've got to reunite that sense and that energetics of yin and yang and then attune to the light. When you do, see the little black watery lines right beneath it? See the little black watery lines? That's the water that fills the cup beneath and the cup overflows. And it nourishes your chakras, which are the lotuses. 
And here in Egypt is the blue lotus. The lotuses burst forth and they bring forth their fragrance. Now, when the Egyptians looked around the planet for a symbol of your sixth sense of the way home, the sixth sense already within you, they noticed that if they went on a long journey and got lost, their jackals could pick up the trail and find the way back. So they took the jackal, but they painted it blue to let you know that it's a spiritual sixth sense that you have. And the fragrance that your sixth sense picks up is the open lotus. You open those lotuses and that fragrance is the key to your trail back to heaven. And they drew it right there. Sinead Jim drew it right in his little evening work in his own little tomb. A magnificent insight into us. The, the blue lotus is the lotus of Egypt. Here they are. You can see she's gathering the lotuses. The white lotus of India, of course. Marvelous concept of the scent of heaven and the way back. So... This afternoon, I'll pick back up after we have our, our lunch break and we'll do some more. Thank you very much. Take care.